In this episode of the Taylor series, we're going to explore the idea of dividing by zero a bit more. Though it's a good idea to watch the previous episode to supply context for what we're about to talk about, it isn't strictly necessary. Anything we need for this video, I'm going to explain here. Division by zero, as we saw in the last episode, is undefined. The reason is because anytime you try to evaluate an expression that has division by zero in it, you end up writing something down that contradicts what we already know about mathematics. That is to say, anything times zero is zero, and multiplying and then dividing by something should get you back to where you started. However, when we dug a little deeper, we saw that there was one case that seemed like a little loophole. The case of zero over zero. We couldn't figure out an answer for it, but it also didn't cause that contradiction. More accurately, zero over zero is indeterminate, meaning we can't assign a value to it, but we may be able to work around it if we come across it in some kind of analysis. In this video, we're going to be doing just that. We'll try to answer a question that serves as an entry point into calculus, and this exploit will allow us to find that answer. The thing we're going to be looking for is called the instantaneous rate of change. But to understand this, we have to build up a few ideas first. We use math as a language in which we write all sorts of theories describing phenomena we encounter in the real world. The idea is that we might be able to make predictions about what's going to happen before it actually does. Because that world is in a constant state of flux, it's inevitable that at some point we're going to come across the idea of change. Change, as it happens, takes center stage in calculus. The way we do this is to make our functions have time as an input variable. Anytime we want to know what the state of affairs are at some particular moment, we feed the function that time value, and we see what it says. To keep things simple, we're going to be considering a function that tells you the position of an object if you tell it the time. Going further, we're going to be dealing with motion in only one dimension, like a ball bouncing or a car driving, as opposed to all three dimensions, so that we will only have to deal with one dimension at a time. Don't worry. When we figure this out for one dimension, it'll work for all three. The idea is we just want to start simple and work our way up. One of the big questions calculus tries to answer is how fast is something moving at a particular instant in time, otherwise known as the instantaneous rate of change. Consider this line. It's a simple function, and if it represented some physical situation, it'd be pretty dull. Something would be moving at a nice, even, uneventful rate, like someone driving to work on a highway with steady traffic. To figure out its rate of change, we would simply ask how far did it move in a given time. With cars, the way we frame this is with the speed limit in miles per hour. To read that, you can think of it as moving 55 miles, the distance, in one hour, the time. So each hour, if you were going this speed, you would have traveled 55 miles. Thus, the rate of change is just what it says, 55 miles per hour. However, where we're headed, we aren't going to start with the speed posted on a road sign for us. Instead, we will have some position points through which we will thread a line, and then we will calculate the rate of change. To do this, we will start at one point, wait some time, and then see how far it traveled. Then, because this is distance per time, we put the distance on the top of a fraction and the time on the bottom. The number we get is the speed. With lines, we call this the slope. Happily, it doesn't matter which two points you pick. If you wait twice as long, you'll have gone twice as far, and the speed will be the same. If you wait half as long, you'll have gone half as far, and the speed is the same. This will matter a little later, so put a pin in this. These are obviously artificial situations. If you're driving, you're going to come across stoplights or traffic where you have to slow down, something like that. If we're going to use what we just learned in the real world, we're going to need to learn how to apply this to nonlinear situations. That is to say, whenever the motion isn't described by a perfect, flawless line. Consider the graph of this function here. It doesn't matter where it came from. When we work out this situation, the process we will come up with will apply to everything else. It's a basic parabola, arguably the most basic one of all, often called the parent function for the family of parabolas. That's because its equation is as simple as you can get and still be a parabola. f of t equals t squared. The rate of change is not constant. If we do what we did earlier, pick two points, wait some time, then see how far we went, then the answer we get will depend on which two points we pick, because the different pairs will usually give different rates of change. Let's call this the average rate of change, because we're basically smoothing out what really happened between the two points, the curve, onto a simplified version, the line. Sometimes, it is unfortunately the case that the best we can do is an approximation like this. Happily, this is not one of those times. We can do better. We just need to adapt to the situation we've been given. 
At any given moment, we get a different average rate of change depending on how long we wait. But what is the exact rate of change at that moment? We call this the instantaneous rate of change, and armed with all we know now, we are finally in a position to explore it. The words rate of change mean we're still dealing with the slope of a line. The word instantaneous just means at some instant, or in this case, a single point. But what line? What would make sense in this situation? The average rate of change could get us close, close enough that we should keep it in mind, but it did smooth the curve out right here. No matter how close those two points are, it's still not the exact instantaneous rate of change at either one of them. If we want to get rid of that smoothing, then we have to consider just a single point. Now, we can draw this. Whatever this line is, it only touches the curve at that single instant, and never again, at least not locally. We call this type of line locally tangent, because it seems to come in, touch the function once, and continue on its way. The good news is that we can see that an answer to our question exists. That is, this line has a slope. The bad news is that it's not obvious how to figure out what the value of that slope is, the rate of change. Earlier, the way we found the rate of change of a line was we waited some time, figured out how far we'd gone, and divided the two. But we don't know the equation of this line, and so we don't know where this point is exactly. Let's back up a step. The average rate of change was getting us really close, even though it did smooth out the curve just a little bit. The closer and closer these two points come together, the better our estimation is. In fact, if we could somehow merge the two points, then we would indeed get the exact answer. We'd be taking an estimation, the average rate of change, and tuning it so that it became an exact answer, the instantaneous rate of change. Let's put numbers and variables to the quantities here, and we can figure out how to do that merging later. Step one, let's label everything. These points need coordinates. The first point, the one where we want to know the instantaneous rate of change, we can simply label t, because, well, it's a variable, and will change depending on how far we want to go out each time we do this calculation. To find the position at that time, we plug this into the function, and whatever it comes up with is our position. We write this calculation as f of t. The second point is a bit more interesting. We're waiting an extra amount of time, which we'll call delta t, and seeing what the position is then. In mathematics, a delta, which is the capital Greek letter d, is a common shorthand for change. Here, it means how much time has changed. If you go into studying calculus, you will see this and variants of it a whole lot. Anyway, the time coordinate of this point is t plus delta t. That is, the instant we're considering, and then how long we waited for our estimation. The position coordinate, then, is just taking that time and plugging it into the function, giving us f of t plus delta t. The slope calculation of our estimation needs two things. How long we waited, and how far it went in that time. How long we waited is just delta t. To find out how far it went, we simply subtract. It's f of t plus delta t minus f of t. The rate of change, then, is just the distance over time. f of t plus delta t minus f of t over delta t. Now that we've formalized our estimation, we want to merge the two points to tune the estimation into something exact. Well, that's essentially tuning the value of delta t down to zero, which means we're dividing by zero. <laughs> but wait! Don't panic! Look at the top. Let's simplify that too. Because delta t is zero, it reads f of t plus zero minus f of t which is just f of t minus f of t, which is just zero. If you watched the previous video, you will know this is the only time, zero over zero, where we can try to recover the analysis because what we have doesn't actually contradict any of the fundamental rules of mathematics the way one over zero would. Indeed, it will now serve as a loophole, and we're going to try to come up with an exact answer. And this kind of makes sense, right? Remember, we could actually see that there was an answer. Getting around it formally is the entry point to classes like calculus and real analysis. We're going to go around this kind of informally so that you can get an idea of what this feels like without going into too much complication. We're going to plug in real numbers to this function, see where it is, and then make better and better estimations so that we can see where it's going. We'll work out what the instantaneous rate of change is at the time t equals 1. The position at this time is 1 meter because f of 1 equals 1 squared, which is 1. Our first estimation will be when delta t is very small, say 0.1 of a second. The position at that time is 1.21, because that is 1.1 squared, meaning the rate of change at that time is 2.1 meters per second. 
Let's make our next estimation even better, say 100th of a second, or 0.01. The position at this time is roughly 1.02, and the rate of change is 2.01 meters per second. Now let's try a thousandth. That means the position is 1.002, and the rate of change is 2.001 meters per second. This pattern continues. It seems to be getting really close to two. One billionth would make this 2.00, a bunch of zeros, I don't know, two. What we're doing is we're essentially calculating the limit as delta t approaches zero from the right. And what we're getting from this series of estimations is that value is approaching two. That is, as it happens, the exact answer. That is, two is the limit when you evaluate this. It isn't the function value itself. That's the zero over zero case. Two is the limit of what that function is approaching as delta t approaches zero. For simplicity's sake, I'm not going to detail the case where delta t goes to zero from the left, but suffice it to say that it also gives you the same answer. Which is important because for this to work, it would need to be the same answer. That is, as it happens, the actual answer. If I look at this line here, it does in fact have a rate of change of two. What that means is that the instantaneous rate of change really is two, but only at that instant. It's not two before that instant, and it's not two after that instant. And there you have it. We wanted to find a value, and we did. There are some extensions here though, and some shortcuts we could build. And if this was a calculus class, we absolutely would. I won't go into detail here, but I will mention some of them to try to spark some ideas in you. First, we need a way to formally nail down the value of these limits and come up with some way of actually calculating them that is reliable. To do that, there are some clever things to do here, but at some point you're going to come across the idea of what's called a delta epsilon proof. These are absolutely amazing, but they're a little beyond what we're trying to do right here. Suffice it to say that there is some very clever logic going on there. Secondly, we found the instantaneous rate of change for a single point, but what about the rest of them? It's different everywhere. Well, that to me sounds like a function. A function where you would hand it a time, and it would tell you what the instantaneous rate of change is at that time. We call that function the derivative. And in this particular case, that derivative is f prime of t equals 2t. We use the prime to indicate that we've taken the derivative of a parent function, in this case the parent being t squared. So if we go to time t equals 2, we can see that the instantaneous rate of change is 4 meters per second. But perhaps most importantly, I want you to come away with an understanding of that process we just did, not only because it shows up all the time in calculus, but because it really is a very fascinating one. We saw a geometric situation where we could tell that there was an actual, real answer that we wanted to find, even if we didn't quite know how to find it. We then came up with an estimation that would get us close to that answer, but would break down when we tried to do zero over zero. We then use the limit to get around the zero over zero case, and then find the exact answer. That process is absolutely fabulous. In this particular case, we saw that there was a slope of a line that we wanted to find, but we didn't know how to get it. So we wrote down the formula for that rate of change, and we noticed that it was going to zero over zero when the time delta t was being shrunk down to zero. We then used the limit to dodge around that. Turns out, you can do this all over the place in calculus. Each time we use that loophole to do something new in calculus, build some new idea, we are using the loophole that zero over zero does not cause contradictions. And that's what I meant at the beginning of the first video on this, when I said this was going to be an amazing loophole, through which we would thread some of the fundamental ideas in calculus. That's going to wrap it up for this episode of the Taylor series. Congratulations to you on reaching the next term in your own Taylor expansion. Thank you to all of my patrons for all you do. I couldn't do this without you. I'm Derek Taylor, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe. If you really like the video, come on over to our Patreon page where you can get involved and see all the cool stuff we're doing.